Let's shout out all the all the members right now. So there's five. We have uh, elite level Jordan Yoakum, Bernie Marcoccio, and Alpha members. That's the highest tier that's below the sponsor level, which is Zane William Nisley, Jeff Frank, and Bruce Willis. And uh, of course, you can catch us over on patreon.com slash Mr. SB. And uh, all the levels we have over there, we appreciate them. Two bucks a month gets you exclusive access to, uh, to the exclusive content that we shoot for Patreon. The elite member level is the five dollar level and you get the discount codes as we receive them uh you get listed in the video descriptions and you get a shout out when you join and then alpha of course gets the shout out every time we do a show and i think we forgot it last time but uh, we apologize for that it won't happen again um let's talk a little bit about the sponsors gobby we got uh garage door guys in kc and then of course we got Arm Assassin Strength Shop, and you got some stuff to talk about with Arm Assassin Strength Shop, correct? Right. What do you got? Well, so he sent me a handle about a few months ago, and uh, I didn't really break it out. Um, I was in the process of moving and just put it right in the storage. Anyway, I broke it out about a week ago and started playing with it. Essentially, the handle I'm talking to talking about is this guy right here. So this this flat level, flat finger deal. Uh, standard. Now I had I bought one of his uh, in 2015 in uh, in uh, Rhode Island, and it was essentially the same thing, but it didn't it wasn't ridged, which which means for me to get a good grip, I had to tape put uh, hockey tape on it uh, so my fingers wouldn't slip on heavier weight. Um, this one is uh, ridged. Um, it's the same principle, but it's a lot more comfortable. It's a lot more dynamic. And uh, we were talking in the last episode with Herman about how really you only need two, three uh, handles potentially. You don't need a dozen. And I personally think, well, the way I pull also is I, I, I do a lot of flat finger containment to stop rotation. So for me, this is my principal number one go-to hand finger uh, wrist exercise. Uh, and it hooks right to my, my cable system on my table. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, flat finger strength is paramount in the sport. So uh, this is the ideal handle for it. And I think I use it, I've used it three, four times this week and I'll use it probably every other day. And I have the Terminator wrench, which is out in my gym right now. And it's pretty exceptional. It's like a wrist wrench, but it's a lot more beefy and it's got the chains that wrap around instead of the straps. I'm a big fan of the wrist wrench as well. The wrist wrench and yeah. this thing, uh, throw in a third and that's basically all you need. Um, in my opinion. Yeah. And I've done a lot of changing up on my routine, seeing how we're stuck, all kind of stuck in social isolation. Uh, I have added a lot more things to my training and taken a lot more of the old school gym movements out of my training. Um, so I should come out the other end of this. And it is interesting times like uh, we eventually are going to have a whole lot of WAL events packed into a very short amount of time. And they're going to have to start kind of lining that stuff up right off the bat, like immediately. Uh, the second we hear that we're going to start coming out of this social isolation protocol and travel starts getting open up again, they're going to have to throw together some stuff really quickly. Any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, uh, I basically go in hibernation mode in the winter anyway, and just and only come out. Even even competing, I rarely compete in the wintertime. Um, I'm an introvert, uh, making more money and saving it. So for me, it's all good. But yes, when it's all done, there will be a, an influx of socially of um, people socializing, tournaments, uh, anything, any events, anything. I mean, Montreal has a huge, massive uh, summer festival uh, schedule, and they've they've uh, canceled 50% of it, which uh, roll right up to the beginning of July which is huge. So if we come out of this and, and the gates start opening, so to speak, in, in, in July, it'll be uh, one of the fucking better second half summers we've ever seen. Like, uh, you know, but it's two extremes, right? Uh, we're in solitude now. And when it ends, uh, there might be a gradual phasing of it. But um, yeah, be, there should be a shitload of tournaments. I'm just, you know, for me, I know nationals got postponed. Provincials got uh, canceled, flat out. My only hope is, um, 
uh, if Steve Pettis is listening, is at Michigan State, um, and I believe it's scheduled for the third week of July. And I just hope he, he, uh, he we get we get that one in because that's one that I I missed last year, but I I really try not to miss it. Um, it's probably one of the best tournaments I've ever been to, albeit it's uh, 30 hours of driving uh, there and back. But um, yeah, so that's my that's my hope anyway going forward. I'll tell you what looks interesting is that uh, of course we have not we're still on the cusp of whether Red Deer is going to happen or not, but we also have that Fallen Heroes event that was announced for November. That looks interesting. But um, we got questions coming in already, and we advertise this as a live question show. So let's uh, – you ready for some, Gavi? Yeah, just before uh, – it's Ryan Johnson who does the uh, the Kansas City uh, – uh, the, 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 the Fallen Brothers thing that you're talking about. And that's, again, it's another 15, 16-hour one way, 15, 16 hours back. But um, that's another one, and I think it's in November, which is a pretty good travel time uh, um, because uh, – you don't hit storms and it's pretty it's pretty quiet but that's another one i've had on my schedule that i just haven't uh, been able to uh, follow through with but yeah that's a big one he, he makes uh, huge super matches great cards great great prizes like swords and fucking daggers and shit so yeah shout out to him excellent from the comments section we already have jody williams in the house got a ton of guys coming on but <clears throat> cameron smith chris gavi versus ryan sp left hand Arm to arm, hook. Who wins? It's funny, right? Well, I'll let you. I'll let you mock mock me. And, and I'm not going to mock you. I won't um, do it. You see, you're, it's laughable, right? Like, uh, but the, the reality is, um, if you cannot pronate, because I have a short arm. Um, now, of course, it's easy for you to pronate, pronate and uh, drag yourself uh, back. And but if you have to stay wrist to wrist and go sideways with me, um, if there's a way we can, because I can't naturally stop your pronation, but. And that's not the way you pull anyway, so it's kind of a stupid argument. Um, but uh, I think I fucking beat you. Uh, it, it, and, and, and my argument on that is if we hooked up a side pressure machine where we keep our wrist like this and we have the, str the strap is like that and we just go straight sideways, I will do more than you. Um, I'll, do, I'll do more than most people. Only because I have a very, very – I actually have a long upper arm compared to a very, very freakishly short uh, forearm, which allows me to ramp up a shitload of pressure on my elbow – um, so, I mean, it's a theory. I could be dead wrong. Maybe you blow through me, but uh, I think it's a decent question. Although maybe people are laughing. Well, I don't know if anybody's really laughing. I mean, uh, there are certain ways to handicap every match that it makes it competitive, but, um, but I mean, to tell two guys to pull on a certain plane of movement and not deviate from that is kind of against all the principles of the sports yeah. and arm wrestling of the sport of arm wrestling anyway. Yeah. Um, I did it with Devin at a practice in 2012. Um, of course, he had, you know, a thousand matches under his arm at the time. And if he wasn't able to pronate, I stopped him. Now, I couldn't beat him, but it was like a two-minute match. Um, um, but I, I'm not a big fan of these cross. Uh, you can only start in a hook. I, I've done it. I've done it with Tim Lewis. We did read to start in a hook only because that's both our, our disciplines. But to take your discipline and challenge another guy who doesn't pull that way is kind of like a NASCAR guy uh, challenging Formula One. Like, yeah, um, it's not his discipline. It's not what he's been trained to do for most of his career, uh, whatever, life. So um, although it's fun, it makes a decent uh, debate. Um, usually it's just ridiculous, and I'm not a fan of these conversations, um, other than it can promote interesting uh, conversation. Well, here's one that should be an easy answer, maybe. Well, there is some debate here. I mean, uh, who's the best 205-pound guy in North America right right now? RVJ, John Berzank, Herman at that weight, or someone else? Well, it's Todd Hutchins. Well, Todd's what? 205. What Todd, did you say? 205. Yeah, he's 205. Hutchins is 205 right now? He he made most of his money cutting down to 195, and you're telling me right now he can't make 205 for, for a boatload of money? Well, I think if it was two months ago when he was preparing for a match in the World Arm Wrestling League, he's probably not going to make 205. He could. What do you think his weight is? Do you think his weight's two forty? His weight's probably, if I'm, if I'm guessing, two thirty maybe. No, I'd say he's not, he's about two twenty three. Um, I've seen he doesn't blow it up like. Uh, I mean, I don't know. His cuts are legendary only because he's old and he's got to cut water. But I don't believe he's he gets up uh, north of two thirty. He did he did he did against Devin I believe, but he looked he, he looked bloated as hell. Um, well, but so I mean, out of the equation, is okay. it RBJ or is it John? Well, it's definitely not John. 
uh, not John anymore. Uh, I know people prop him up because of his past, but um, age is age, and uh, he can't train the way he did. And it's one thing if he had this unbelievable hand that uh, he can just omit the arm. But against RVJ, for example, he would try to go high, and RVJ would either go high with him and go to straps or hook him, and he has more a heavier arm right now. Um, but to, to answer your question, um, it would be a toss-up for me between um, – RVJ and Herman with Paul Lynn. Paul Lynn's a wild card because I believe he's in that tier or very close to it, but we haven't seen him. But his progression tells me and his, his raw natural ability tells me he's he's on the periphery of being in that conversation. But if I had to bet and I wanted to see one super match to, to dictate who was the number one 205 guy in North America, it's uh, Herman versus RVJ. And if, um, if both are in, in, in top, top shape, which we don't always see Herman in top shape. They both are in top shape. I give the nod to Herman. But, I mean, that's a 50-50 that's a proposition. I think John's part of that conversation, especially given on what was about to happen in 2020 and what might still happen. But I guess time will tell. Which is what? You're talking about uh, uh, Mezarenko? You're talking about yeah. the bottom eight? Uh, the, the, uh, the top eight, 195, uh, 95 kilo. Um yeah, I don't think he was going to do much there. Uh, he was going to do some stuff, but he wasn't going to win it. Uh, and he, he wouldn't have inflicted the damage Herman or RBJ could have done. But then again, it's pure, it's pure speculation because we haven't seen John in years. We don't know what he's doing. We don't know how hungry he is. I'm just going by sheer the, the decline of age and the decline of, uh, admittedly, uh, his limited ability to train uh, due to shoulder injury and stuff. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but, I mean, you know, the one thing about the sport is anything's fucking possible. We've yeah. seen it all. But yeah, RVJ and Herman. Matthew Osborne, where do you rank Rick Heiderbrecht in the super heavyweights in Canada? Uh, Rick's top five, probably in the lower end of that list. You think uh, top five? Well, let's do the math, right? Uh, let's do right arm. Uh, okay. Super heavyweights. Are we including are we, are we including uh, Devin Larat and Matt Mask in that conversation? Yes, as well? I think you have to, yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, so we're looking at... Well, if we're looking at right arm, Devin's number one. If we're looking at left arm, you're number one. But let's let's go with right. So Devin's number one. Um, I would say you're number two. Mask is three. Maybe Rick's four. Um, who am, I, am I leaving out somebody? Um, oh, of course, uh, Justin Major. Would Justin Major beat Rick right now? That's a. That's I, a I, don't I don't know. I don't know. But that's but I, I four and five would be Rick. I give the edge to Rick only because he's more seasoned and has a one hell of a um, career. Um, so I'd go Rick for Justin five. Uh, so, uh, maybe I'm missing someone. Um, uh, I mean, Mike Gould and Earl can beat. Well, there's I Len, think. there's uh, Dylan. Yeah. yeah, I think those two are both on. That's just, and I'm, of course, I'm biased because I see the Eastern guys more and I've seen them more uh, live. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, after five, it gets dicey. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's no big tournaments where we can sort this stuff out either. Like it kind of it, it it becomes difficult, especially in the situation we're in where nationals has not happened. Um, here's here's one for you. Do you put guys like? Well, you got to talk about Evan in there a little bit. Do you put guys like Chris Boschman in the top ten? No. Um, well. I'll be purely objective with him, even though I think personally he's a clown. But he, he could be because we don't have – we have, like, a studly top five, and then we have a bunch that fit in that second tier, and he might be good enough to fit in that second tier. But he's not touching Evan. He's not touching Len. Uh, I don't think so. But then again, I, I think he blocked me or I blocked him a couple of years ago because of this – his his just – not that it's – Well, I've blocked him. I've blocked him now because – no, yeah. See, um, I block some people not because I, I, I'm offended. Nothing offends me. It's just it's nauseating to keep seeing their shit come out. It's just it's just nauseating. So I just uh, remove them. But I don't believe uh, like I don't think he beats me. Me trained at a decent weight. I don't think he beats me. I don't. I think he's a, a tier two. I don't even think he's a tier three unless it's something has happened that I haven't seen. But from what I've seen, now he might say, "Well, I took third at nationals." Yeah, but. Like my friend John Lassard said, in 2005, we went to Nationals, and there was, he took third. He finished behind you, 
Scott Stilwell, or maybe with you and the Ryan Zilepa, uh, Mark Zileppa, and he ended up taking bronze. And people were like, man, you took third, you took bronze. He was like, there was only four in the class. And I think three left, four right. Who was that? John Lassard from Quebec. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Has, uh, has wins over Evan, has wins over uh, big wins. Evan, here's another big win over somebody. Um, well, he, Tim Bresnan, he has wins over Tim Bresnan. I mean, he's he's really? another guy. That, he's another guy that fits in that six to twenty range. If we're going uh, a Canadian uh, super heavyweight, Evan Evan can be great one day, and some, sometimes it, it seems like he shits the bed. But his his ceiling, or what we've seen him potentially do, almost puts him in that top five. I think he has. He might have a win on Rick. Uh, he has wins on Justin, but now Justin has wins on him. But Evan's in that four, five, six, seven range as well. Um, it's it's interesting. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. And of course, Mike Gould and Earl on any given day. Um, if Mike Gould and Earl could secretly train for a year and come back and yeah. be in the top three, like it's yeah, yeah. So, but that that's we just don't see. We just don't have the uh, the the the, the um, current sample size, right? Yeah. But they're up there. They have to be just on sheer um, uh, status alone. Well, this one guy says Ryan didn't attend Zlati Tour left arm. I'm not sure if that's an observation. I did not attend Zlati Tour left arm. I was planning on going and uh, and doing it this year. But, I mean, chances of that happening now are... It, the, the, here's the problem. So, even if we get out of this by, say, end of July, mm -hmm. the world opens back up. We can travel. We can do whatever. It's going to be very difficult for me to throw something else in the mix when there's all of a sudden going to be a huge volume of tournaments that are happening all of a sudden. And there are some things that I will remain open and committed to. Uh, and one of those things is World Arm Wrestling League. And I've been staying in touch. And now I don't have anything to report that's earth shattering. They're trying to keep their social media accounts active and trying to uh, add some stuff to that. And that's about all they can do right now. But I think they're going to have a very aggressive schedule should all of this clear up in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. There'll be a huge influx of, of events uh, in, in a compacted schedule. Um, and, and like, let's say we get out of here. I, I think we're getting out of it. They'll start slowly opening up our, our freedoms and uh, or our ability to travel and the restrictions, minimize the restrictions come um, beginning of July. So then you have, let's say, end of July right till November or December to pack in potentially 50 events across the, uh, across the planet that, that, that promoters will, try, will be trying to shoehorn in here and there, stepping on each other's feet. But I have a feeling. I have a feeling that all arm wrestlers are just going to want to arm wrestle, and promoters are just going to want to fucking promote. That there won't be too much, um, um, you know, there won't be too much uh, tension and fighting. It'll just be like, hey man, go where you need to go. There will be enough events for everyone. There will be enough pullers wanting to pull. Um, the problem is, like you, you might hit three events. Well, those three events might end up on the same weekend right now, uh, or two events. Uh, so uh, people will have to make decisions. But yeah. there won't be a, there won't will not be a lack of options that's for sure not in that four yeah. five months. Uh, so it's, a, it's good news in a way. It sucks in another. But shit, we we'll return back to normal next year. Um, what do you want? Um, next question is Jerry Cataret versus Lalatin right arm best of seven PAL rules and tables. What is your prediction? Who asked that question? Uh, stronger than every woman on earth. Asked that question. You see, that's... You want me to go cool. first? Yeah. Jerry Cataret. Yeah. Four matches to two with no need for a seventh. Yeah. Based on leverages and maybe lack of experience pulling somebody like Jerry. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of the conversation I had with Chance Shaw the other day. He messaged me and says, I might have a super match with um, Mark McPhail. And I said, well, I mean, you're in that tier, but... Mark does not need his hand, right? And and from what I see from Chance, he's a very textbook levered arm wrestler. Arm wrestler. He's not a bad position. Uh, although he claimed he he can, you know, he, he, his hand, his side pressure is stronger than his hand. Anyway, so again, you can argue Chance Charles is a better arm wrestler, but that is a nightmare matchup for him. And just like this is a nightmare matchup for uh, Batali. I mean, uh, I, I fuck. Uh, 
Vitaly is such like this new shiny toy that you want to go with him only because he's so fucking uh, amazing at what he does. But the, but it's hard to disagree with you because yeah, four two five one because and and when the match stops um, and the tall guy's extended leaning back and Jerry's compacted pressing down without his hand. Now, if Jerry can withstand Michael Todd's under the table antics for what was it, 17 minutes of pulling in a you know or something like that uh, two years ago. You can be sure that he has the uh, the grinding fortitude to outlast the tally, who I'm sure does not have his level of um... correct. So yeah, you have, but that's a fucking great question. The because only that's, that's, that's a clash of styles. Yeah. And the only way that the PAL rules, I think, would have an effect on Jerry negatively is elbows, rigid elbow fouls, shoulder and shoulder over center. Otherwise, yeah. I, I mean. Think... It, it, but then again, if we said wall, Vitaly can go back further. But um, it, it's, it wouldn't change my opinion one, one way or the other. I, I think uh, PAL is a, a better argument only because it's rigid and um, it's enforced unilaterally. So um, I kind of like that. But yeah, that's, yeah you got to go with Jerry because, uh, you know, he's not taking the, I mean, he doesn't need his hand. And this guy's a, you know, a textbook top roller. Um, yeah, you know, is he going to slam in their shoulder to shoulder with Jerry? Well, then he loses. Is he going to try to press Jerry? Well, not likely. Uh, Todd couldn't do it. Um, Devin could it? though. Devin did. So yeah. that that was an anom- not to take anything from Devin, but I think that was maybe an anomaly um, of Jerry maybe not being prepared. Some really odd looking refing. Um, maybe that that just didn't make sense to me. Um, yeah. Now, you could argue Devin was just that powerful and strong that day. But to consider, we've never seen anyone do that to Jerry. And uh, eight months later, uh, Devin was under the table, um, getting away from from Chafee and, and uh, Todd, uh, Todd Hutchins. Uh, I, I can't believe that's the case. But um, I don't know. But uh, Devin has an arm uh, that's co- that, that comes with his hand. Uh, Vitaly, uh, he doesn't really have that balance on hand and arm. He's, he's hand heavy. Which is a fucking colossal nightmare for him. The fact that he's, you know, six foot seven and a half, six foot eight, does not bode well either. Uh, he's most likely going to need to get extended, just like Alex Tredecha did versus um, um, Krasmir, right? Yeah. Uh, once that tall guy gets extended, um, fuck. It's almost like that that the table isn't ideal in certain positions. That table's not ideal to be uh, ideal for a guy six 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 seven plus. Uh, you see Shaquille O'Neal on the table. I mean, that's not that's not comfortable. Uh, in certain positions, pressing straight down maybe, but if you're if you get out of a position out of out of a favorable favorable position, six one six two sure six seven six eight, you're in a world of problems. Hey, you got a troll question, Gavi. Yeah. Have you mentally recovered from the blue crushing him at bottom eight? <laughs> um, <laughs> and man, and Bowen's and Bowen's ascension. Yeah, into I was a actually, higher tier arm wrestler. <laughs> and in top 10 best arm wrestling days that I've ever had, or even if I go top five in terms of money put into my pocket, travel paid, that's top five. I took a loss to him, yes. But don't forget, I was paid 500 just to show up. I was, yeah. I was, I had a $500 super match with the left. So I went and all travel was paid. So I came out of there with $1,000 and I lost to a right dominant 200 pound puller who had, at that day had 50 pounds on me. So am I embarrassed? Did I have to go into hiding? Did it crush my soul? Did I turn turn to drugs and alcohol? No, I made a thousand bucks. I defended my left. I smoked him left, which of course people yeah, I didn't pull left. Yeah, and I'm I'm left dominant and gave up fifty pounds. Um, and and you know if 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 Evans cr- cracked him, I'd be a little bit. Eh. But once once he beat Evan, and once I saw that he won he won the whole tournament, you have to give him credit for. I didn't think he'd win it. He won it. I gave him credit. I give him credit now. Um, his ascension as a tier two to a tier high tier three has been impressive and, and was beyond my prediction. And I was wrong. But to say that was a crushing day for me, man, Luke, I've had crushing days. Benji Dwyer up to nothing. Then he comes back with straight uh, flop wrist presses to take $1,000 out of my pocket in Connecticut, in a, in a, in a, in a foreign bar. Um, out of my country, everyone, you know, cheering for him. That was a rough day in my, in the first six months of my sport. When you deal with days like that, making a thousand dollars while losing to a heavier right dumb guy, I didn't lose any sleep. It was a good day. I don't know. But, uh, 
Now I'm going to ask this question. I'm going to let you answer it first, and then I will tell the truth about it. Uh, do you think WL infl inflates the weight of super heavyweight guys? 1,000% yes. 1,000% yes. Absolutely. <laughs> and then the second part is, did they post your true weight when you competed for them Ryan, against Jerry Ryan? No, they didn't. They didn't inflate my weight. It was actually 388, and I think that's what they posted. And here's the thing. I believe they did. And here's the thing. If I was running that league and I'm catering to 95% of my demographic who are not knowledgeable arm wrestlers, I would do the fucking same thing because I want people to say, well, Mike Aiello is 315. I want guys. Did they six, say Mike Aiello is 315? No, no, no. But if a guy's coming to the table 6'6", six, six, kind of like WWE did that too. Guys, well, all the time. Yeah. Uh, um, what's his name? Um, uh, fuck, I forget his uh, Big Show. Big Show was in 7'2". Come on. He's not. But, but maybe he was 6'9". Six eight, but seven two four fifty sounds good. Just like Devin coming in, what in what at his biggest and saying he's six five or six six two eighty five sounds better than two sixty two with his clothes on. But they're pound, pounding down food. They're weighing in with their fucking shoes and clothes, and I think they did that with Todd, and I think that they did that with Devin. But guess what? I would fucking do the same thing because the people that don't know any better, some of us are sitting back saying that's bullshit. Mm -hmm. But 99% of the viewing audience is like, oh, wow, cool. He's he's massive. He's huge. You know, Paul Lynn's like, dude's a beast. Yeah, we know Paul. We know he's a beast. Well, I, <laughs> I, I can tell you they didn't inflate mine. And I didn't. I haven't paid attention to the other guys. Maybe they don't. Maybe they yeah. don't. But uh, I don't know. I'm speculating they do. Because it, it's smart. It's smart. It's a smart. It's smart money. Well, it's the old school WWE tactic. Yeah. Eventually, you're going to stand next to some of these guys. And... Um, I can tell right. you that Hulk Hogan was still my height, even though he's lost three inches through surgeries over the years. Yeah, he was a legit six seven, six eight, yeah. I believe. Uh, but they listed him at six nine, I think. But guess what? The people that will eventually stand next to these iconic wrestling, uh, like, are point one 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 percent of the the total viewing audience. So lying is smart business. Lying or, or inflating weights and heights is smart business. Um, I do it on dating profiles all the time. You know, women are always shocked when they meet me for the first time and I'm five, ten and a half. I'm like, hey, you know, you met me. We're here. You drove here. Might as well get on with the date. But they're disappointed. But guess what? It got them to the date, didn't it? Oh, that's devious. Um, all right. Ryan versus Ermi's Gasparini. Your thoughts on how it would go off if it was this season? I've never, th I haven't thought about Ermi's yet, really. Again, um, is he the more, more balanced uh, pound for pound? Uh, is he better than you? Maybe, but again, he needs his hand, um, or he need, he he's he's a at the very least he's a levered hooker. He's not a junk puller. A nightmare for you would be uh, like Todd Hutchins, a guy who who doesn't need his hand and will con concede pronation your pronation. Uh, this guy won't do that. He'll fight you high, and you have the bigger hand, higher arm, uh, more polished high game, perhaps. So, I mean, I give the edge to you. Um, um, you're, you're a little bit stronger, slower version of Mask, and Mask beat him. Um, so, um, Yeah, but that was weird, that match. Like, of course. I, I of course got nothing out of watching that at all. Like, I, I, I got nothing towards uh, no gain knowledge about Hermes Gasparini other than Matt can dominate the setup with him. Yeah, he's he's a fucking tier four. He's a badass. Um, but yeah. again, he's giving up 130, 40, 50 pounds to a, a to a puller that pulls similarly to him. I mean, can he win? Sure. Um, but I'd give you a slight edge as a favorite. Slight, not huge, but you, you, I think you'd be favored. You'd have to be. The question for me: Have I ever pulled Cody Merritt? A lot. Yeah. A lot. That dude didn't pay attention to our our previous <laughs> seventy five podcasts. Yeah, <laughs> I have uh, lost to Cody once on fouls at 2018 Worlds, and I came back from the B side to win. Um, beat him in WAL, and we were supposed to have a super match in August, but it's been canceled based on uh, what's going on in the world today. Yeah. Oh boy. Uh, training question: What's better for the wrist, dumbbell curls on the bench? with pressure going below or wrist curls from the top through a cable system 
the pressure going through the fingers. I the think I know what they're talking about. They're basically talking about standing wrist curl with a with a barbell. Yeah, uh, the answer is that well, they're they're talking about that archaic dumbbell row where your hand goes into the negative and your the flat of your forearm is on the bench, right? Is that? Oh uh, yes, yes. We all started. So with, cables. Yeah, of course, <laughs> yeah, um, and it's not even close. Yeah, um, there's no positive. Argue, I, but... yeah. I can argue that that first that first exercise is almost detrimental. You're better almost not going to the gym. You're it's as off. good as doing grippers. Yeah, it's, it's up there as with the yeah, it's up there with that. Okay, filtering through. We got a lot of comments here, man. There's um, a BLM thing. I like talking about BLM. He's interesting. Um, I'll, when I see it, I will bring it up. Okay. Cody Merritt is in the house too. Uh. If only Gavi could hit as fast as he talks. Yeah, I'm slow as fuck. <laughs> I might be the um, yeah the, the slowest reactionary arm wrestler in the history of the sport. Can we get your thoughts on Kelly Leach and his brother? Love watching their matches. They never give up uh, and will fight with or without their hands. I think they're both animals and they got a big future. Um, great Canadian boys. Uh, salt of the earth dudes. Um, tough as nails on the table. Second um, generation arm wrestlers. Yeah. Dustin's um, textbook balanced, fierce. Um, he's the younger one. Um, really, really polished. Um, Kelly is just pulls stupid, unorthodox, and is one of the hardest motherfuckers to finish, I think, uh, especially in that 165, 176 class. Um, he's just a fucking nightmare. Um, but, um, yeah, great guys. I've lost yeah. them both. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think they both kind of trade off those fit to fight championship belts yeah. from time to time. Uh, have you, you talking about this one? Have you ever pulled BLM? What's your read on his level? Yeah. I'm, he's well, a, I've never heard of him. I've never. I don't need to to arm wrestle him to know what his level is. Uh, he's a he, he's a, a perfect example of if you talk enough and if you promote yourself enough, you can raise um, the perception of where you are. Now he's an excellent arm wrestler. He, he's one of the most table savvy arm wrestlers I've ever seen, but he still lacks that high end strength, which will hurt him. Um, so he's he's a tier three. Uh, and, 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 of course, he's there saying bullshit. I'm, I'm, I'm fucking a champion. Yeah. Who have you beaten? You've beaten Brendan Alstelsor, who's a level three and a great guy, but a level three. You've beaten a huge Canadian strongman giant who couldn't arm wrestle. Um, strong as fuck, but not on the table. And you, you hooked him and beat him in a hook. Uh, and he was trying to top roll you. Um, and that's it. Like, what? Uh, a whole bunch of twos and threes? Like, he's never beaten a four. He had a match with Paul Lynn two years ago, and he lost. Now he'll say, well, he was in there and he made mistakes. Yeah, but you fucking lost. When Paul went sideways, you you went you went for a ride and you lost because your weakness is side pressure. Now, that's the critique part. Now, the, 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 the positive is he's a great guy. He's obviously passionate about the the, the, the sport. His, his IQ for the sport is high. Um, and he's ascending, much like Paul Lin's ascending, he's ascending at a very, very uh, high clip, and we don't know where that ends up. Um, but he could be he could be one of the greats. Uh, but right now he's a three. Yeah, I don't know where he's at. Like, I would assume that he's, I mean, he's gone hunting, so I respect that. Yeah, hey. And um, yeah. I, I, I think he's yet to prove himself, but I'm looking forward to the day when he does. Uh, oh, Candy Passmore says they inflate the weight of the guy's weight numbers, but deflate what is shown for the females. Well, as they should. I'll I don't do know. The same thing. <laughs> I'll do the same thing. Herman says PAF inflated their cash prize numbers. So it was 50K <laughs> when it was zero. Yeah. How, how do you... <laughs> yeah. Cody Mayer have... yeah, says, who is Kobe? Oh man, who does Gobby think is fatter, me or Raymond? <laughs> Raymond's not fatter. No, that's a good question because you're the bigger man. You have more body weight. You probably have more fat on your on your frame, but you're sitting at 
29, 30 to 31, 32 at the highest body fat percentage? I mean, you're a big man. He's maybe 40 pounds lighter than you, 30 pounds lighter, but sitting at a 75 to 77% body fat clip. The guy's a fucking colossal slob. Um, and I don't mind him. Like, he, he's entertaining on Facebook, but that guy's dumb and he is fucking fat. Um, but uh, he's entertaining. M. Miller, Gobby, are you going to make good on your Facebook promise to attend the 2020 Michigan State Tournament in a red Speedo? No. Um, <laughs> only, only because um, I, I wouldn't be allowed in, right? I'd be kicked out. Um, there'd be issues. I probably couldn't get back. I'd probably be arrested, which means I couldn't get back into my country, which means I'll probably lose my job, couldn't pay my mortgage, lose my house. So um, if there's a way I can get in there and not get kicked out or arrested, uh, maybe we can meet in the bathroom stall or something. I don't know, but uh, for, yeah. that's that. That's a dangerous proposition. <laughs> Jody Williams says, I love grippers. Jody, stop doing grippers. Start doing farmer's holds or something else, but stop doing grippers. What are your day jobs? Gobby, what's your day job? Um, chemical processor. Um, one of the reasons I have so much work right now, and we, had a, we all had a raise in salaries, is because one of the products we make is hand sanitizer. And we're making them uh, in many more of our stations. Um, but yeah, I, I, uh, I'm a chemical processor. Yeah, I make yeah, so tons of I'm a realtor and a uh, municipal politician. So I'm on city council for the city of Portage and Prairie. There you have it. Nice. Jody Williams, Gobby, is it more beneficial to catch your opponent after all once your opponent hits and you catch them, you haven't used any motion yet? Thoughts and concerns? Um, no, no. If, if someone's catching, like he, in his definition, it's happening in the novice and amateur ranks. In, in, the, in the pro and elite pro, no one is catching. What they're doing is hitting for position. So to answer your question, mm -hmm. and I don't ever hit to pin uh, unless the guy's terrible and I just want to get the match over with. I hit to fall, fall into a, a position where I'm comfortable with and my opponent hopefully is not. Um, so there's a difference between hitting for position opposed to hitting the pin and catching. Uh, you will never see, now you can see an elite, you can see Ryan catch me. He'll catch me with his hand and stop me. You can see that. Um, but you're not gonna see Ryan catch Bordelato or Mask. And if it looks like he's catching him because he's that strong, he's probably pitting for position, which means he's incorporating his shoulder, his chest, uh, other aspects than just the hand. But it seems like he's catching him, but he's not catching him. That's correct. And if I were to utilize a catching style of technique, it is exactly that. It's hitting in a way that when the match stops, I have the advantage, even if it's over on my losing side of the table. Yeah. A good example is RVJ. RVJ has such a hand... Um, he has a, the hand of a super heavyweight and even then some. So a lot of times when he's pulling a two, you can see him or even a three, he's just catching him. Just strictly controls the hand and stops it. And I'm sure at that point, his elbows not, are, are not, his elbow and bicep uh, is, are not triggered very much. But when he pulls a four, he's not catching him. Either. And if it looks like he's catching Justin Bishop, he's not catching him. He's surging and with enough complete force with his arm and his hand and his wrist, he's stopping uh, Justin's pronation and stopping him in a hook, but that by no means is catching him. Yeah. Uh, so I think this is, uh, oh no, this is for me. Which arm wrestler from Europe would you like to pull? Uh, Gennady and Kurdecha. And I want Gennady in World Arm Wrestling League. Yeah, man, that's a great matchup. That's a super, super matchup. I would like that, and I would like it in the 600 series. So for World Arm Wrestling League, if you are watching, I want that match. Can, <laughs> can you talk about the use of pronation and a hook? Um, yeah, I, I smashed this on um, this, this post on Facebook. Um, I can't, I can't fathom. I haven't seen this post, so tell me what this is all about. This. Yeah, um, I cannot fathom um, being in a in a hook with somebody and having the ability to just say, you know what, I'm tired of him being wrapped through my hand. I'm just going to start pronating him. And, and um, 
it's almost like when we're, when we're talking, we're talking a, a four versus a four, a three versus a three, a five versus a five. Very rarely does we've seen uh, Devin do it with Marcio when Marcio is fatigued. Very rarely do we see two hook pullers or two people in a hook when one guy decides when they're both fresh. One guy decides he's going to start pronating into a high hook, because any good hooker cannot be pronated out of his hook by definition. Um, um, and if he does, it's because he's fucking fatigued. And it's at the end of a match where lactic acid is kicked in. So it's like we're arguing something that should never, ever happen in an elite versus an elite matchup, which is basically the um, the template which we should always, always be discussing. So I don't understand it. Or maybe because I have such a shitty small hand and I'm so bicep and sideways driven that the idea of me pronating in a hook, once the hook is set, um, is not even a, a consideration. But... But even if you're looking at it optically, you don't see it that often. You don't see, yeah. you don't see, you see high hooks. You don't see Devin and John in a, in a in a in a hard hook, wrist to wrist, and then Devin saying, "You know what? I've had enough. I'm just gonna start pronating." And the problem with pronating when you when that even if you're pronating to start a match or pronating in a match, the problem with pronation is it's almost like um, a risk reward thing. Where if it works, man, you you just gotta win. But if it doesn't work, you might have just buried yourself. Because you're putting yourself, if, if the pronation doesn't doesn't work, you've opened yourself up, and um, the, the the opponent has a, an advantage. Uh, you were impatient, and now he's driving harder and has more leverage. So pronation is a funny thing. You better know exactly how much you have and what you can do with it if you're going to start doing stuff like that. Because I've won many many matches because I'm on a hook with a guy, and as I go to surge, he's not really comfortable with the side pressure, so he tries to pronate. As he pronates, he loses guard on his side pressure and bicep, and that allows me a flat lane way to pin so and i'm glad he tried to do that because if he just would have stuck in hard with his elbow it would have, maybe would take me an extra 30 seconds to pin him so i love when hookers or anyone in my hook tries to pronate unless I'm, it's a minute in i'm fatigued and they see that out but we're not talking when when you're down to 10 percent uh ideally we're talking when when both yeah. are relatively fresh yeah and <clears throat> i picture a guy like jerry Catteret where if you're fortunate enough to pull him over and you have an offensive position in a hook if you then panicked and started to pronate jerry will happily give you his hand and then yeah. you're game over for you so I, I don't know what kind of practical application there would be for that sort of preparation mm -hmm. anyway um let's see Speaking of WAL, I heard that the winners don't get to keep that wad of cash they hand you on the table. True or false? Uh, that has to be false. That has to be false. That they don't get to keep it? Well, here's it's the false. deal, right? They have to Every, keep it. Here's the deal. Because well, they're already getting paid. They're already getting paid, right? Maybe yeah, well, you get a win. Generally, there's a bonus to win. But when I pulled Jerry, I lost that match. But... I knew what my win bonus was going to be. It might not be the same as his win bonus. Right. So it's entirely fathomable that you don't get to keep that cash. But either way, you're getting a win bonus. And when I get paid, they don't hand you cash in the United States. It goes directly into my bank account. So it's very seamless that way. Um, whether or not they get to keep the cash on the table, they're getting paid to win that match. It doesn't matter who's pulling. They're probably getting a win bonus. Yeah. It's kind of like Game of Arms when the, the winner got 250 bucks uh, and they, they physically give him the money. Uh, they put it on the table and he grabs it. Like, does he not give it back? Or is that actually always getting paid? Like, I don't know. But it, it could just be. Yeah, that show was ridiculous in that sense that it's like, I'm winning, sick of working my 100 hours yeah, a week. And I'm going to go win this 250 bucks this weekend and yeah. it's going to change my life. Yeah. No more car payments and mortgage. I just made 250 bucks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I've traveled from Erie, Pennsylvania to San Diego, Cal <laughs> to, to have this arm wrestling match for $250. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, boy. Do full range bicep curls have any use in arm wrestling? Bicep hey, health. Hey? They, they have to. I mean, if, if all you did for a period of 10, 15 years are statics, I feel bad for your elbow. Like, as a rehab, you need to do full extension for, for blood flow and rehab. Now, and I even think what I would do is 
I'm always, I was always trying to strengthen my bicep. So the, the, the go-to was always a static, but if my elbow started hurting me and I needed to, I, I couldn't strengthen my, my, my ligament or my tendon. Well, I, that was an opportunity for me to strengthen the bicep head, the dynamic part of my hook opposed to the static part of my hook. And, and I would do um, full range minimum. I'd say usually it was eight reps because under six reps was enough weight to, to, to make my elbow feel it. So it was usually eight, eight, nine reps. Um, and I would do full range with the idea that if I, if I'm able to increase three, four percent of my dynamic bicep strength, when I go back to my statics a week later, they will be, or I will hold the same weight, my max weight, maybe three, four seconds more, or add five, 10 pounds on my max hold. Um, because the bicep tendon, people say, well, the bicep is all about the bicep tendon, the bicep tendon and the bicep work, work in conjunction, um, uh, you know, uh, Full range curls, more bicep than tendon. Hooking, arm wrestling, more tendon than bicep. But make no mistake, they, they work together. Um, yeah. So there is room for it. But uh, if you never do it for rehab or for whatever reason, you're, you're limiting your potential. You're limiting what you can do or how much strength you can potentially gain. Right. Uh, I'm not sure I understand some of these questions. Maybe it's language barrier. What if the what do the top five heavyweight arm wrestlers look like if Dave and Devin win their upcoming matches? Well, if Dave beats Levon and Devin beats Michael, how do you put those two guys in the rankings? I guess that's the question. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting one because Devin has that big win over Dave. Fairly dominant. But then again, Dave's beating arguably the best arm wrestler on the planet at the moment. So I don't know. How do you rank him? Do you put Devin first or do you put Dave first? Oh, for me, Dave's first. Uh, only because uh, when they had to pull, Devin had to, um, you know, couldn't pull him straight up. Could not. Had to run, 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 run. So, which tells me that um, doesn't mean the win doesn't matter. The count, of course it counts. But in my mind, in my ranking structure, um, the odd, the, when there's a doubt, um, the uh, benefit of the doubt goes to the man who stands up to pull and pulls with um, um, the, the right way, I guess you can say, or uh, the proper means. Well, now that we're on that a little bit, I mean, what do you think of the IFA putting love the rule it. in place? Fucking love it. If, if I was not already in love with the IFA, um, this is the clincher. Um, and, you know, driven by Rick Pickney, I don't know if he initiated this, but I heard him talking about it on your on your uh, personal podcast, um, which is awesome, by the way. Um, Thanks. You're right. If, if I can't plug my, my co-host show, um, what kind of asshole would I be? Um, but no, uh, I, I think it's great. Um, and the fact that they're now, of course, um, the fact that they're going to enforce it and one warning and then bang, um, it's a step in the right direction. Um, it's a step in the right direction. And uh, there's a couple of people that probably are disappointed. But for every one person that's disappointed with that ruling, there's probably, I have to be, believe there's about 25 people that are ecstatic. So it's good news, I think. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting. It changes the dynamic of things a little bit. And then there's a question, what kind of weight am I using on your side pressure for a heavy day? Um, I've not, 400. The, <laughs> not, not 400. Not uh, 400. I can pull 300, but I, I regret it after. Yeah. Yeah, and that's true weight, 150 to 200 pounds. Yeah, um, no one's asking me, but um, back when in 2008, nine, when my elbow, my elbows were super healthy and I was um, at my strength wise and I was at my peak, I remember putting my body weight on on a single cable, so like straight weight, one pulley, um, 162, 163, and pulling it across and holding it for six, seven seconds. Left arm, right couldn't do it. Left, left, left arm, right couldn't do it. Right did about one thirty. Hey, uh, Gobby, is uh, Herman actually black? <laughs> He's in the comment section. Ask him. His, his father's black, but his mother, I believe, is um. Is is his mother or his wife Asian? Oh, I and Herman, his, his and Herman, if you are still watching. Go over to the video on Crossfire, the latest one, and answer the guy's question about your nationality. Oh, he's, he's black. He's black, but is he 100% right. black? Just the fact that he's educated and makes over 90000 a year, I don't think he's... But nationality is beyond race. So the question is, what is the nationality? Well, he's an American. 
ancestry <laughs> ah that's a good question so i can say i'm canadian but there's other things before that i know he has two two three generations of, of right from louisiana so they're they're his his roots are right in the, the south um must have been hard years for his grandfather Fuck. Do you think Alan Makiev is uh, in the conversation for a future top 95 kg -er? I think he's already part of that conversation, isn't he? I mean, he's definitely top 10. Uh, left top five. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's what he decides he wants to do. I mean, the guy has got a crazy hand to grip around. I can tell you that personally. Um. He celebrated a little bit too hard on a phantom elbow foul win for me, but whatever. That's just versus, my personal Versus hey? who? Versus, versus who? me. Oh, wow. Remember the uh, yeah, yeah. Moldova? Right. Yep. And uh, the question is, Ryan, if you're pulling Kurdecha, what's your strategy? Uh, test his hand and make adjustments. That's my strategy. Cody Merritt says Matt can pronate through Devin's hook. Um, Matt's in a fuck. Matt's Matt's pronation is on, like is some crazy. He's if he's next. not if he's not the number one top roller on the planet, um, him and Vitali are uh, he might be second or third. I don't know. Uh, Taras Avakin historically was one of the best rollers, but I mean Matt Matt, Matt Mask isn't uh, the standard, right? He, his top roller is worldly his pronation is something else yeah but it loses a little bit in the strap so which of course it would but which means which means his top his top roll comes more from his hand than his brack yeah uh, that's right why is right hand more important in arm wrestling because there's way more right-handed people on the planet is my opinion gobby but well there, <laughs> there's a lot more right-handed people on earth but you have to understand that when I'm right-handed, but I'm left-dominant. I would, oh I would venture that if you took 100% of the, the arm wrestlers, um, active arm wrestlers in the world, and you would say, well, 92% of them are right-handed, then why are 48% of them left-dominant? So just because you're right-dom doesn't mean you're going to be left-dominant as a puller. So the answer is, um, and you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you'd have three weight classes right, and you'd have one left. When I first started arm wrestling in 04, 05, you would have three, four right, and two left, maybe three. You always have a little left. Today, or for the last decade, it seems like it's equal. All tournaments, they give out cash, nice trophies. Everywhere I've been, um, it's been equal left to right um, with very little exceptions, I think. So yeah. now I think it's uh, people are pulling both. Um, it's healthy to pull both. And um, like I said, I, I would I would wager it's maybe 55, 45 right, right dominant to left dominant pullers um, with, with a small percentage being pretty much equal. There are some guys that are just... Um, they'll say they're equal. Uh, maybe the right stronger hand, the left has a stronger arm. But when it comes to performing at a tournament, um, they handicap the arms equally. Um, yeah. What's our current weight? 151 and a half pounds. 350. How do you feel about using bands as primary strength training tool over free weights? I've been using mine more because gyms are closed, and I like the instability of and ascending tension. Who wrote that? Uh, Grip, just a guy named Grip. That dude needs to get slapped. Um, stra uh, uh, bands are strictly for rehab. If you're using bands or you choose to use bands over free weights to build strength, you're a sounds idiot. like he doesn't have a choice right now, though. That's the thing. Oh well, if you don't have a choice, it's better than nothing. Don't no no. We're, I'll, I'll, I'm, if we're talking theoretically, if you're talking he has no choice, well, bands serve a purpose. Dave Chafee loved using bands, but they, they are nowhere, no way as close to being a, a proper substitute to free weight or even cables, which is free weight. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't ever use bands um, because I like cables. I like constant tension. I can see some merit to... But that's the thing with arm wrestling. Um, if you're going to start in a position that would be considered a starting position and then use a band, 
and you like the ascending tension, that's great if you can initially get to the, port, the, the point where you're stronger. Uh, otherwise, yeah, it's a rehab thing, but. What I don't like about the, the bands is that the band is not, um, usually the band is right across your wrist or in your hand. Now when you're arm wrestling, your hand is in a fairly open position mimicking <clears throat> and when you're training, you should be mimicking the position your hand will be in. Flat yeah. finger, depending on your hand size. Grabbing a band, going sideways, grabbing a band and going back pressure. You think, well, I'm doing something. You're doing something. But the neuromuscular connection with your brain does not transmit perfectly to the table, that training. Um, unlike putting a three-inch handle or uh, some type of uh, simulated grip on a cable system and, and going back or going sideways, uh, angled. <coughs> so, um, I mean, it has merit, but it's nowhere close to free weights. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, but and, if it's all you got, I mean, you can do an yeah, amazing yeah. amount of, of exercises with a towel. So get creative. You can go out and get yourself a rock or a bunch of them and put them inside of a towel, and you can do all kinds of different resistance exercises with that. Um, to say that you can't get a workout in because the gym is closed it is just false. Yeah, and, and um, I think... Uh, bands because it's sustained in light pressure it can be you can use it as your foot you can use a doorknob uh, so you can bring it to the to the tournament and just warm up with it you don't need a partner necessarily um, you're not gonna bring a 10 pound 20 pound dumbbell in your bag to the to the, to the tournament so bands are, are convenient and awesome to warm up because you can sustain blood flow um, without elevating pressure um, so I like bands for that but in terms of progressive strength uh, for performance no but yeah, you can see a lot of people. Well, oh, I put on thirty pounds. I'm not training. I get the gym closed. Fuck off, man. You can't do push-ups. You can't do sit-ups. You can't run. You can't go find a tree and do chin-ups. Um, uh, you know, like we have that challenge where people get creative and stuff like that. Like, there's so many things you can do. But like human nature, we, you know, it's easier to say, well, I, it's not easy, so I just won't do it. Yeah. But the opportunities are, are ample. Let's make sure we close the show by talking about that competition because. I have had some people reach out to me and say that they want to uh, send videos in for that. There's been some questions, but let's close with that um, when we get to that point. Sounds good. Question for you both. Uh, in what years of your careers do you think that you were at your peak arm wrestling strength? Now, I assume they're not talking about like the year, but probably the age. Um, well, in... Uh... I would say strength-wise, probably 2008. But what happened with me is up to 2009-10, I was a um, bicep hook puller, which means I would stop the match. And much like Tim Lewis, you most arm wrestlers when they start hooking, they start using their bicep as a um, focal point, and they stop the match and they drag and they open up and it's a drag hook. What happened at about year six or so, like most arm wrestlers that. Uh, end up hooking and hooking hard is you start building uh, your inner elbow and in 2010 11 I, I did I, when I got my uh, arm Badansky cable thing for my table and I started uh, isolating my elbow um, all of a sudden my side pressure numbers went up crazy and of course at the time I was 30 mid 30s so I was healing well and I remember John Milne uh, who was one of the top 220 guys uh, in 2009 2000 to 2009, 2012, and he came to practice in Montreal, and we pulled right-handed, and I remember him uh, stopping him um, and just um, out-hooking him. Uh, I was 165, 167, and I remember saying to myself that day, and that's one of the few, and it was a six-month period where my right was stronger than my left at the table, in the gym, and at tournaments, um, and I remember saying to myself, I believe, hook to hook, right-handed, I might be the best in the world. That's probably false. But I felt so incredibly strong. Denny Dubray, who was still an active tier four at the time, would come to my practice and I would just um, uh, hold him uh, with my right. Now, practice pulling is kind of bullshit because John was notorious for going to Devon's the day before. So when he came and pulled with me, uh, he might have been at 60%. But Denny was always fresh and rarely go to, went to tournaments. So when he came to your place to practice, he was healed and fresh. But 2011, my right arm felt great. And then uh, it kept getting injured and I kept pulling the same way and it, and it kept getting inflamed. I couldn't maintain that progression or even sustain that strength. And then it started declining and my left started ascending. But for me, uh, 2000, in terms of being a polished uh, 2000, 
2011, probably where I was peaked. And 2011, I was what? It's uh, 36, 35, 36, that range. Well, for me, if everything goes according to plan, it'll be 2020, 2021. You're an optimist. I like that. We're a good, we're a good, we're a good uh, conflict that way. We're a good mix. Yeah. And it's hard for me to say what my best years were because I know probably if you took the whole sum of my career and the biggest tournaments, biggest wins where I felt the strongest, 2008, I felt pretty unstoppable. Um, I was pulling Earl back from losing positions at the Nationals. Like I had a really, really good year uh, and did not go on to the World Championship that year, but it was it was a good year for me. But things are changing rapidly, and this uh, let's this next question kind of speaks to that a little bit. Controversial question: How do you feel about Ayello talking about uh, the steroids he takes, and then he's going to IFA? I mean, I think it would be naive to assume that everyone that goes to the IFA Worlds is going to be natural or the the WAF Worlds. It's just not the world we're in. Well, because he knows that number one, he can beat it. That you can avoid. Um, you can go on on different esters and 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 test negative, even even while having stuff in your system, um, or not having stuff in your system and then putting stuff in your system. Um, and I think what he's saying is. Um, he's almost mocking them to say, you're going to want to test me, but if you have every any, any integrity, you can't pick me out. Uh, you That's have to use it, right? So he yeah. might be just mocking them. And you are using like reverse psychology where they say, well, if we do pick them intentionally, um, we almost look like we're um, antagonists, right? Almost and then like what does that say about their testing process if he passes at that point? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's almost brilliant what he's doing. Uh, and, and of course, because he's being completely transparent, it's I love it, right? He's ballsy and doesn't give a fuck. But there's also a tactic behind it um, that, that's that's quite intelligent. But if a guy says, yes, I'm taking stuff and I'm going to this tested tournament, isn't that confession enough to disqualify somebody? I mean, it's not official. It's hard to say, right? Um, but even, number one, he could be. He could be joking. Number two, um, they might issue him a, an official statement and see what he says. But even then, saying you're on, I don't think it's a, just like it's not illegal to say you take cocaine. If you're caught with it, it's illegal. I don't think it's illegal to say you're going to a tournament uh, on steroids. Now, they, 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 they might want to test you, and maybe they can, maybe they can't, but I believe it's random. And if they try to circumvent that by intentionally, they could be breaching something. So, he, uh, like, I don't know. I don't yeah. think he's doing any ad admission. I mean, it's, I don't know. Uh, he's still allowed to show up, and they're still allowed to test him. But the way they, they, they go about testing him or who they test, I think, is the, the, the critical thing here. Yeah. Six months from now, with 10,000 American dollars on the line, Travis versus Matt Wrighty. Travis. Me too. Travis. Travis is one of the best money arm wrestlers ever, if if not the best. Him and John, but Travis is the reason I say him over John is because when he's not motivated, he's beatable. John motivated or not, John is John. Um, yeah, and then Travis. Travis yeah. I don't know if ten thousand dollars really motivates yeah. Travis. Ten, ten would be the ten, ten would be the minimum. But the thing is, Matt Mask isn't Dennis Saplankov, right? It's not. We're talking about. I'm not sure if Travis comes off the couch right-handed, unmotivated, automatically loses to Mask. Mask is not a tier five. Travis is a tier five when motivated and not a high tier four. Matt, Matt, Matt's a tier four. So they're, they're the same level when Travis isn't motivated. But, um, and if he's motivated, he, he beats him. But Matt, I mean, um, I don't know. Travis gets a strap in that match. And who's a better strap puller, Travis or Matt? So for me, uh, Travis might beat him on, on straight skills alone, uh, unmotivated, with no money on the line. Hmm. Uh, I don't think that that's a good, that's an interesting question, but he could have picked a better example than Matt Mask. Um, Devin, perhaps. Um, um, why do you guys think Wall has so few guys from the UK? 
Well, there are not there are not many elite arm wrestlers from the UK. We have Paul Maiden, who's really uh, slightly past his prime, so he's no longer maybe world class. Although he's probably still elite, but not. But I mean, good enough for Wall, and he, he's a he's an interesting personality. So we can say Paul Maiden. There's the the guy, the the tall lanky guy that that uh, what's his name uh, is already on the roster. And then after that, uh, Neil Pickup's no longer a world class puller, uh, world class um, you know arm wrestling icon. Uh, announcer, all that stuff, but no longer a puller. Uh, so what? There's maybe two. Back in the day, you had um, Steve Curlew. <coughs> um, he was a uh, he was a world class puller, a lightweight, middleweight. But there's not many of them. Hey, Gavi, we had. Uh, I know we got a ton of stuff. We're gonna have to do this again because we got a ton of stuff in the comments section. But we actually had some guys that um, took the time to send us in some email questions. So we should get to those, and then we'll see how much time we got left. Yeah. Dominic G emailed in. I was listening to the podcast with Neil, John, Devin, and Angan. John mentioned that one of the biggest tournaments ever took place in Amos, Quebec, and yeah, he's not sure if he said it right, but yes, it was Amos, yeah. Quebec. I am Quebecois, so I am a little curious. Could you guys tell me more about the past event? Yeah, I don't know a ton about Amos, Quebec, but I know they had tournaments there. And that everybody went, including Cobra and Gary Goodrich and a yeah. bunch of the guys from the States. But um, um, the last one I heard of, and this was prior to me coming into sport, was uh, late uh, 1990s, early 2000s. And uh, Mike Solaris, uh, Sylvain Perron always had great showings. Gary Goodrich, um, Cobra Rhodes, John, um, tons of cash. Uh, Amos Quebec is a, a redneck. Uh, rural town, uh, francophone town in, in, in Quebec. Um, and I don't even know who, who promoted it. It was prior to me coming in the sport, but I recall Denny talking about it and Sylvain talking about it and talking about Mike Solaris and Cobra and John and Gary and, um, you know, uh, uh, there were some uh, studly Quebec lightweights, two middleweights that, that gave Denny good matches back in the, um, you know, 1990 to 2002, three uh, period. So yeah, um, it was legendary. That's all I know. But I cannot, you know, I wasn't there. It was before my time. It's all theoretical. It was yeah, before my time as well. I think it was was it early '90s was the last time they had something like that there. No, I remember when I first I, I got in the sport in 2004. I talked to NG Bergeron, and he remember he came, he got in the sport in 2001, and I remember he said he went to the last one. Now okay. was it one with John and, and Gary? Probably not. But the Amos did have a big cash tournament. Um, in, in the 2001, 2002, and I think it was the last one. But I, 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 it probably didn't attract the big names like it did in the 95, 96, 92, that 1989, that, those years. Yeah. Yeah, I hope that answers this question. It's, uh, but if you want more information on it, Eric Rusin is the guy to talk to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he'll, he'll have a complete roster, uh, Eric. Yeah. For sure. he, uh, he has the history of, well, almost worldwide arm wrestling, but especially in Canada. Sheldon Short has submitted us some questions, and he said, uh, I get asked a lot, and maybe you could shed some light on the question, what muscle groups actually help with the sport of arm wrestling, and what groups should beginners work on in through their routines? Uh, work into their routines, sorry. What muscle groups? Everything from the chest up, and then well, even... <laughs> pri uh, the priority is, uh, is your bicep. That's the engine. Um, and then even if you're uh, well, brachialis, you're a top roller or a hooker, um, and then and then you're looking at the pec girdle, right? So pec front delts um, when you're talking about side pressure. So those are your, your staples. Um, and of course, to, to prevent injuries, you want to have back, you want to have lats, you want to have uh, rear delts to prevent. Uh, I tore my rotator cuff because I did so much front delt stuff and neg neglected the rotator cuff, rear delt, back stuff that I, I tore my, my rotator cuff left in, in 2007-ish and I had to rehab it for eight months. I couldn't even open a car door. So um, balance is huge, but bicep, my arm wrestling always went as my bicep numbers and chest numbers went in the gym. I have a different approach when I'm teaching a beginner. Um, I like to get a brand new guy on the table and teach him nothing and see where he goes and test out where he is strong and then kind of try to build yeah. from there. But where, where uh, is he going to go? Like, it's going to be bicep and chest. There's no not necessarily. Some guys come in and they, 
uh, I will put them in positions and I will see where they have possibly the greatest natural gifts and then try to work on those things. So it could be hand and wrist, but I mean, you always have to focus on yeah. the key elements. There's, I don't recommend guy, new guys training side pressure like crazy anyway. No, but uh, and if hand, the answer is a tricep, and if the answer is a tricep, you're, you're going to hurt him. Um, yeah. he, you shouldn't be pulling with your tricep in your, in no. your first years. But yeah, um, yeah, I agree. If he seems like he's going to be hand, hand heavy, definitely try to emphasis, emphasize his hand. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. And he has follow-up questions. I still do a lot of full body work to help with overall health and fitness, but do you think the five main lifts to help with our sport? Uh, but do you think the five main lifts to help with our sport? Bench press, squats, deadlifts, overhead press, and bent rows. Um, those are all great. I still think you should train every muscle group, but I don't really deadlift anymore. Uh, don't do a lot of squats. Still do some bench, but not heavy anymore. Overhead press, I use a Viking press. Um, and bent rows, if it suits me on that particular day. Staying in shape is important. Working every muscle group is important for balance. I don't know that you can put it inside a box, specifically for the sport. Yeah, the, the danger with some of the powerlifting lifts is uh, the cleans and the snatches um, force you to have negative wrist flexion. When in, in our sport, we're trying to uh, have positive arm uh, flexion. So I remember trying to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start doing, I remember in 2005, I said, let me start doing some clean and jerks. And my arms were fucked for two weeks. Because what you're doing is you're, you're, you're forcing your tendons to explode. You're forcing your wrist to fly back. And, and, and it's the exact opposite of what we try to do. Now, not the tendon part, but you don't want to do something in the gym that's going to impede your ability to get on the table and do real training. So uh, deadlifts are important for general strength. I think if you're over 40, deadlifting and squatting becomes more um, essential only because you need your test levels, that your test levels are going to start declining and you need to mit mit mitigate that. And one of the better ways to do it is squatting and deadlifting, power, core, movements with heavy weight. So they have their room. They're just not going to make you, uh, they're not going to jump you as a tier arm wrestler, that's all. They're just that's important. Right. important and I, I think evidence of that is... Um... If you watch the video where Devin's working out in the gym with Eddie Hall, you know, like, it's like a fucking monkey. Yeah. It looks like a monkey humping a doorknob. Like he just looks terrible. I'm just kidding. All I was gonna say is his lifts are not impressive. So, or, or I, when he was bench pressing, I almost think like he's he's trolling us. Like he's doing the cable crossover. I'm like, come on, man. Every arm wrestler has done cable crossover work for their pecs. Or is he just mimicking us or, or trolling the arm wrestling community? Or is he that innate in doing dynamic gym work? I don't know. But it was interesting. He definitely did not look good. Yeah. Uh, I do tell especially beginners to do leg workout just for the benefit of building test and growing through this muscle group. For sure. So, yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah. I, uh, I don't do much legs anymore because my knees are not, not so good. But it is what it is. Fair and then there's a whole conversation about TRT going on in the comments section. But TRT and cycling testosterone are not the same thing. If you take the recommended dosages, the typical athlete will take much higher than what the doctor prescribes. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. No doubt. Yeah. Anyway, Gabby, we're almost yeah. at the end. Do we yeah, want to talk I'm about our contest? Yeah, let's do it. I'm down to 2% on my on my laptop, so I don't have to plug her in. So, let's yeah. do it then. Let's talk yeah. about it on Rosas and Strength Shops, giving away 50 bucks in the month of April. We're just taking videos of home workouts, man. Can be any length, can be anything you're doing. Throw them in the mix. Gobby and I will give them a watch. We'll pick a winner. Yeah. Sound about and, right? Uh, yeah, and I saw Herman say that he'll address the... Uh, the, the blackness issue. Yeah, next time he's on with us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's going to talk about his, his nationality. Yeah, our numbers are pretty good when he's on. People like to hear from him. We should put him on once a month or something like that. He's popular. Well, we do have Luke Polster coming on next week. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. On Friday, same time. Nice. So we do have a guest lined up for next week. And then we'll see. Sounds good. All right, All right ladies and gentlemen. Any yeah, closing thoughts, warm. Gabby? Keep warm, keep isolated, and uh, this too will shall pass, right? I mean. Uh, it always does. Yeah. It always does.
All right, buddy. All right, we'll see you next Friday. All right, take care, guys.